I always love second service. You guys uh, are kind of my, I li- get to live vicariously through you guys. Uh, I it was, it was one of those mornings where, you know, you just wanted to pull the blanket and just stay in bed because it was cold this morning, wasn't it? And so you guys got that reality. And so I, I, I like that uh, about you guys, that you guys get to stay and uh, to do that. But before we get started today, we're just going to open with a word of prayer. Father, we come. We're thankful for today. We're thankful that you are a God who hears our prayer. God, we ask that you would move in our hearts and our lives as we open as we open your word that you would move in such a way that we could we could sense it and feel it and see it. And God that it would be our reality that you are moving us toward the person of Jesus in likeness and in image. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We've been in this series called uh, Renovation, and so we're in the fourth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Let me give you a really quick, really quick, uh, just kind of the backdrop and the context of this. This is happening about 450 years before Jesus comes onto the scene in his, in his body. He was already there, right? He was, he's God, so he's, all, he's eternal. But he comes to earth about 450 years after this uh, this uh, this book is be- taking place. The book of Nehemiah is about a guy, but it's really about what God is doing through his people. And uh, there's the people that are in power at this point are the Persians, and they're the the, the superpower at this point. And Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. Judah has been, the nation of Israel has been exiled all over the place. And this guy, Nehemiah, he was Jewish, but he was the cupbearer to the Persian king. What happens is that the Persians have now allowed some of the people to go back into, into their homeland and to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple, to worship their God. So they've been around about 100 years. They've been back from this exile. Nehemiah gets a report that the walls are still broken, the gates are still burned down, the people are in deep distress. And so Nehemiah says, I gotta do something about this. And so what he does is he begins to pray. And then he asks the king, can I have a 12-year sabbatical, millions of dollars, and your signature, and he gets all of this stuff, and the good, the good hand of God was upon him, it tells us in the text. Nehemiah goes to the city, he scouts it out, he gives his best um, brave heart kind of speech, gets everyone kind of motivated. They begin to build the wall around, um, around together, and there's this community of people kind of doing this together. And so you have people who are perfumers, you have people who are goldsmiths, you have everybody's out there, they're rebuilding this wall together in chapter three. You might ask at this point, you might ask a question, why after 100 years is their wall still in ruins? Why after 100 years are, are they there? Were these people just lazy? Was the leadership ineffective? And one of the things that you need to do, and we're gonna, we're gonna walk through a little bit of theological stuff to understand what's happening. The book of Ezra is an account of this, and uh, it's part of what's happening. They're, they're trying to do a large building project in a resource-scarce environment. And so they're trying to do this large building project, but there's not all these resources. That they don't have enough resources to do it. It's kind of like being in the UP during hunting season, right? There's just, you cannot find a contractor that's gonna help you out at that. There's not resources, there's not laborers, there's not enough workers, it's, it, winter's coming, they have other projects to do, and, and that's what you see in the midst of this. There's just not the resources there. There's also a PR problem. There are people that are pushing back and it's happening to them, and there's an agenda that's against them. There are two people that have been have particular agendas, and some of it, and what we're going to unpack today, is some of this is not just flesh and blood, but this is a, a real spiritual reality in the midst of it. And we're going to do a little theological work to understand this, but I think we understand, we understand the physical world. We understand reality. We understand what we can see, what we can touch. But the Bible, over and over again, describes this, this reality that we can't see. There's this spiritual world that's happening. And the physical and the spiritual are often intertwined. 
And, and we think, well, that, that, that happened over here. That was a spiritual thing. This is over here is a physical thing. And often it is, it, it's intertwined together. And so there's this cumulative effect on these people that is both a physical reality and a spiritual reality. One of the things that's true for all people of God for all time is that there is an opposition. There is an opposition that we will face if we are connected to God, and that opposition is God's enemy. The scripture tells us that God's enemy, um, there's no way around this. This is what the Bible actually says. He actually has a name. And his name is Satan, it's Lucifer, he's a rebellious angel, he has a whole army of fallen angels who are opposed to the work of God. If you read the Bible, this is an undeniable truth. You, you cannot deny this, it's there. And this is, um, this is something that as we, we walk through this thing and we look at this, when we talk about spiritual re- reality, we, I think of, you know, my mind instantly goes to Halloween, right? Like the cool Halloween movies, people's eyes are glowing and, you know, their heads are turning around, things like that. That's really not um, how it usually works in the Bible. But there is this enemy that is against Nehemiah, and it's a spiritual enemy in a physical reality. They're intertwined together. And the reality is, is that is true for us, too. God has an enemy, but God's people have an enemy. The logical flow is that the people of God have this enemy because it's, it's God's enemy. The enemy of God hates the people of God flourishing. If you're a follower of Jesus, there is a demonic force out there, and, and just listen, it hates you. It hates you. And the, it wants everything um, to push you, to direct you, to guide you away from Jesus, away from the things of God. If you try to live out your life in a way that is saying yes to Jesus, what will happen in your life is that you will run up against this at some level. And you're like, what in the world just happened? How is this happening? Why is this happening? Um, He will not leave you alone because the demonic forces, the Satan and his team and his demonic team want nothing to do with you living your life connected to Jesus that it glorifies him. They want to take that away. And and so they will come up against you. If you've never experienced that and you've said yes to Jesus, you might ask the question, well, why, why not me, right? Why have I not experienced that? It could be that you are saying yes to Jesus but not living, you're only kind of half in. Here's the deal. In war, think about war for a second. If somebody's kind of half in, you don't really need to snipe that person out, right? They're just kind of half in. They're kind of walking around. They're doing a few things, but they're not really in. They're not in it to win it, right? But if you go in it to win it with Jesus, I will tell you, you're gonna come up against opposition. You're gonna come up against these demonic forces. It just is. And this is what we see in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah runs into opposition and it's, this opposition is very human. So I, this is, I don't want to allegorize this, this tale, but it is, so it's not purely symbolic, but underneath the very nature of all of this are, is this demonic, this going against the people of God. In this text, you will see this as a guy by the name, and this is the human, this is the flesh, um, Sanballat, and we introduced him a couple of weeks ago, and he was a villain in that story, and he's a villain in this story. Remember why they're rebuilding this city? That was going to be a place for God's presence to be experienced by everyone. It's also in preparation for what? Jerusalem was preparation for the Messiah. It was, it was, they were preparing for the Messiah to come. They didn't understand that totally, but that was part of what was happening. And so if you are Satan and you understand this, of course you're gonna come up against this. And so he uses and he influences this guy by the name of Sam Ballad to be this. Um, before we, we get to this, we need to understand what's going on and why we know this and how we see this. There is a book uh, in the Bible called Zechariah. And there's a high priest, and it talks about this in chapter three. This high priest is named Joshua, and he's mentioned in this thing, and he's trying to do his best to help the people worship God, but things are not going well. They're just not going well. If you read that book, it's just not going well. In in Zechariah, you will see that the high priest was facing opposition, the same as Nehemiah, but in the third chapter, he doesn't just stay there. He pulls back the curtain, and we see this, this spiritual world and this physical world coming together. 
And so we're just gonna read these verses. I'm gonna read these verses and we're gonna take a quick look at this because I want you to see this from a scriptural uh, point of view. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand, right side to accuse him. Uh, Joshua is facing earthly challenges. There's a spiritual battle that is opposing him and his work. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. It is not this, is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. I, he can't play the role of high priest. That's what this means in this. He can't because of his own sin. As he stood before the angel, the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have, given, I have taken away your sins and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. This is what's happening here. All, that, all of us are clothed in our sins. We're all, we are, none of us are righteous. Everyone that has walked this earth has sinned and fallen, again, fallen into the shame of this. And Satan is pointing this out. Satan is saying, hey, the, this guy is, he's, he's the high priest, but he's not worthy to be the high priest and he's exploiting that. What God is doing is going, no, this is my high priest, and I'm going to clothe him with righteousness. This righteousness comes from Jesus, and they put a clean vestment on his head, meaning he can fulfill the role of high priest. There's this whole reality that we can't see, this whole other layer that we can't see. Satan hates it when God's people commit their lives to the glory of God and to God's glory. He does whatever he can to stop it, and he uses really three things pretty predictable. He uses other humans, these human agents. He uses our own flesh. I have enough of my own junk in my life, my own sin, um, to go, man, I can't be used by God. He uses the world around us to discourage us, dissuade us, and confuse us. These are very predict predictable um, uh, predictable ways that Satan uses and his demonic forces use to, to move us in a direction away from God. My premise is these tactics in Nehemiah are seen. And, and we're gonna look at that story. And there's these, these guys, Sanballat and Tobiah, who oppose him, and, but they oppose him in a very human way. And, but behind all of this is the reality that there's this spiritual wor world going on and they're enemies of God and they're working through that. So let's go to chapter four. And verse one, when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. Sambalat and Tobiah didn't want Jerusalem to, to flourish. Um, and, and so why did they want, not want Jerusalem to flourish? It, they didn't want that because they were kind of the regional directors at this point. They're the ones that were controlling the economic structures around that area at this point. And so if Jerusalem comes up and rises up and is flourishing, it's gonna hurt their bottom line. And so money is a motivator here in this, in this text. And so they began to jeer and they began to ridicule them. When Sambalat heard that they were building the wall, he was greatly incensed, he ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria. So Sambalat is a bully, that's who he is. And so bullies always bring an army. And he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiath, he's back on the scene, the Ammonite, who was at his side said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stone. And so what does Nehemiah do? And he's prayed some incredible prayers up to this point. And he prays. That's what he does. And he prays with this identity. And he says this, hear us, our God, 
for we are despised. He's just honest. This is hard. This is difficult. These people are coming up against him. They're saying mean things to him. They're kind of hurtful things. He's, they're saying, hey, your wall's not very stable. Even a fox is going to take it down, right? And, and so it, it's, it, has, it has hurt. It has, it has pain on it. And so he says, here is O God, for we are despised. <laughs> Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builder. Principle number one, when the enemy taunts us, when the enemy taunts the people of God, go to prayer. And that's what we do. And that's what he does. He goes to the prayer. They don't get back, they don't go back and forth and they're like, oh, well, you're this, you're this. They don't go back and forth and like tweeting out things. They don't, they don't go on Facebook and have a big rant on there. Um, they just don't do that, right? They go, man, God, here's what's going on. I'm gonna tweet out to you, God. You, you know this is happening in the midst of this. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. They become, they be go, hey God, do you not see this? And they began to pray. They began to go, this is where we're at, God. This is what's happening in the midst of this. This, this thing that's happening isn't, these aren't just like little jokes, like, like, if you've known me, if you hang out with me, I will make fun of you at some point, and it's because I love you, um, and I think it's hilarious, um, and, and so, but it's not malicious. It, it, it really isn't malicious, but I will get a couple good zingers in there, and I will think I am funny as all get out. These are not what these dudes are doing. This word that is used uh, there, th this jeering or this ridicule in Hebrew has no redeeming quality. It has no redemption to it. They're not saying in the midst of this, hey, this over here is happening. Your, your wall is not very strong. You need to build it. So they're not, that's not what they're doing. They're not teasing about that. They're not, they're not doing it that way. They are, are maliciously attacking them. And there is a form that they use in the midst of this. This scorn is formed, number one, in anger. It, it, it is, so if you look at the passage, it says that they were angry. When Sambalat heard this, they were rebuilding the wall. He became very angry. He begins to talk to other people, right? He begins to bring other people around. And what are they really angry about? They're not really angry about the wall. They're angry about the, 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 the nation of of. Judah actually flourishing at this point and taking something from them. And so they're enraged by this. And so what do they do? They began to ridicule. They began to belittle. They began to diminish the image of other. You feeble Jews. And, and then they mischaracterize their efforts. Will you build the wall in a day? They never said that. They never said that they were going to do that, right? They, they never said, and, and this is what they're saying. They began to, to be ridiculous. Why do we do this to our opponents? Well, number one, it makes us feel better, makes us feel right, um, but we're trying to tear down their efforts, right? We're trying to tear them down. This, my friend, has become the template for so much of our public discourse, this is what happens. This side says this, and then this side says this. And neither one of them are saying anything that is fully true. Like, was the wall probably not as good as it used to be? Sure. Would a fox jump up on it and knock it down? No, that's just not true, right? And were these stones gonna become alive? You know, are they gonna come? Well, they were. They were building this thing up. It was starting to happen. And so one of the things that you see in this is this voice of the enemy, and it's always to tear down, it's always to destroy, it's always to do this, and you will see this in your life at times. You will see people come, and they'll try to uh, pursue you in such a way that pushes you away from God. If you believe that God has called you to go and take a step in a direction, and, and there's others that are coming alongside you going, yep, this is true, um, I, I, you gotta do that, you gotta take the next right step with God. And so one of the things that will happen is that they will try to insult, they will try to gather other like people, they'll try to intimidate, they'll try to mischaracterize, 
and it'll become an obstacle. And so what do we do? We take it to the Lord. If you live the way of Jesus, you will be mocked in this world. And now that we know this voice, we've heard this voice of Sambalat, I think one of the things, and maybe people aren't as, you know, sometimes you're thinking maybe, oh man, this person did do that to me. This is how they're, that I, they're my enemy and they've done this and they tried to mischaracterize my efforts and these, all of these things, and I can see this. But there's another voice that speaks to you. And it's the voice that's with you all the time. And I wonder, and I ask myself this question, is my voice more like Jesus' voice? Man, I love you, dude. I know, you screwed up, it's okay. Come, ask for forgiveness, I'll forgive you. Man, you can do great things with my power. Man, well, I believe in you. That's the voice of Jesus, right? Or is my voice more like the voice of the enemy? Is it more like Sambal? It's you build things that a fox could knock down. Look at you. You think you're going to do something? No. People are going to know that you're a fake. You ever hear that voice? Man, there's times where I do. And you know who that voice is from? It's not from Jesus. It's from the evil one. And it happens in our head and it happens in our mind. And so I ask you that question, how's your voice? What does it sound like? Does it sound like the spirit of the Lord saying, man, I love you, I forgive you. There is a way forward, you are mine. Or is it whispering, man, you're a scam. Don't let people know. God will never receive you. You will never do anything. Man, Nehemiah hears this voice and he responds in desperate prayer. When we hear that voice inside of us, that's what we're we're to do. So he responds in desperate prayer, verse six. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height for the people worked with all their hearts. He prays and they build. For the people worked with all their hearts, but when Sembalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the people of Ashad, the group is growing. Do you see this? The group is growing. Heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and, and that the gaps were closed. They were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. What does Nehemiah lead the people to do? He, he, he does something here. He, he leads them to pray, which is consistent with him, and then he sets a guard. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet the people. Principle number two, when the enemy of God frightens us and threatens us, we go to God in prayer and, and, and we are prudent. And it's not like we just go, God, this is it, this is all. And God gives us all these resources, Right? He gives us resources to do things. Nehemiah had a guard. He goes, man, I'm gonna put that guard up there so I know what's going on. God gives us resources. They're all around us. It was only one guard in this part of it. It It's only one guard. And he goes, man, what are we gonna do next? But he brings it to the Lord. He prays, and then he's prudent. He's practical in what he has and what he uses. I wonder sometimes, I wonder sometimes, do we do just one or the other, right? Like, I'll just pray about that, but I'm not gonna use any of the things, and God's, you know, all, all these things that are around me, these practical things that I could do, and, and, and God's like, dude, I gave you all that stuff that's around, like, put a card there, that's a good idea, right? Like, the book, the Bible has both this, this, this idea that we pray and that we believe and that God is gonna do something, and it also has this book called Proverbs, which is wisdom, right? Like this is, the, this is the thing that we use. We're gonna use both of these things. Now, wisdom without God is just ordinary. Wisdom with God is extraordinary. When you take and you go, God, this is what I got. This is all I know. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put this guard here. You better protect him, God. And, and, and I don't know exactly what to do, but I, this, is, this is what I have right now. And I give it to God. It can and will become extraordinary. But just practical is just ordinary. Just prayer without using the things that are, are around us is just foolishness, right? Just foolishness. 
I, I'm trying to learn this stuff. I sit on a board that's, uh, these guys are brilliant, right? They're, they are wise, practical dudes. And they, they, uh, they, we come together and we have some plans and we have some thoughts and we have some ideas of what we're supposed to do. But man, we are, are learning together just to go, this is what we got, God. We don't really know, o- open hands, whatever you think, but this is what we know. This is what we understand, but God, would you do something with this? The same thing that what we're doing here today. When I preach, it's just ordinary. It's not my words that will change your heart. It's not me who does any of that work. It is the spirit of the living God. And so we have people praying for this service before it ever happens and going, God, would you do something? It doesn't mean that I don't study I just wing it. I don't kind of just come come up here and just do it. Here's the deal. Here's the reality. All of you here have at least one sermon in you, and I can show you how to do it. Every one of you have one sermon in you. It's the week after week after week thing, and you could come up here and you could preach an extraordinary sermon for you, but if the spirit of the living God is not with you, it is gonna be ordinary. That's the reality in everything we do. Like, this blows my mind every time I say it. The the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is inside of me. It's inside of you. Isn't that amazing? Like, that's the kind of power we have. Do we access it? We may access our wisdom that he's given us, but do we access the, the, the beauty? And this is what, this is what Nehemiah shows us, that he does both. Think of how terrifying this moment is. Think of how terrifying this moment is. These people are walking by and you can see the swords on their side. Maybe they, there's a hammer in their hand and they're wondering if they're going to get attacked. You have to, to, you to go to sleep at night. Is there going to, is there going to, are they going to be under attack? Nehemiah, he's not a soldier. What is he? He's a, he's a foodie, Right? He's not a soldier. He's just a foodie. He like tastes the, the king's wine. Mmm, delicious, not poisonous. Here you go. Right? Like that's his job. He's not a soldier. These guys around him, these this this Sambalat and, and Tobiah and the, the Arabs and the Ammonites, these dudes are cruel warriors of war. This has to be a little scary, right? I'm gonna put a guy up here and I'm gonna pray. This is what he does in the midst of this. And he's doing this because he believes that that God is going to do something. Let's move on, verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. The Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over. Wherever you turn, they will attack you. Okay, so this is what's happening here. It's like the bullies have, have gone out and they've told everybody. 3.30, after school, we're going in and we're gonna have a fight, right? Is it, this is the time, it's gonna happen. And so people are like, man, you're gonna fight these guys? These guys are warriors, you can't do it. And by the way, there's a bunch of rubble, there's a bunch of junk happening, this is really hard work, um, and you don't really have con- enough construction workers, right? Like you can't really do this. And so there's all this discouragement that's coming around them, and the bullies are saying, hey, we're gonna come in and we're gonna kill you. This is, this is the picture. This is the picture that we see. Everyone around them is going, you must stop. You can't beat these guys. So what does Nehemiah do? Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up. And I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, I love this. He goes, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. Fight for them. It's another Braveheart speech, right? He does it again. Principle, 
when the enemy attacks and discourages, we remember our God and the people he has put around us. The enemy of God is trying to create a place where people lose courage. You ever been in that place where you just look around and you go, man, evil's winning. I don't know what to say. Evil's winning. It's just, that's winning. The people of God, and I'm, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm not gonna subject myself to that anymore. It's not worth the fight. I just wanna go home and take a nap, right? What does Nehemiah do? He goes, no, I'm gonna give a great speech. It's one that we should post like every morning when you, you get out of your, your, your jammies and you, you go and you, it should be on your mirror, right? Because this is our reality too. And Nehemiah wasn't just fighting against people. He was fighting against dark forces. And you too are doing that. This should be on our, our mirrors. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families. Fight for your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When there is discouragement all around you, what do you do? You remember you remember, you remember the Lord. If God is for you, who can be against you? We forget this sometimes though, don't we? We forget this. We forget who our God is. We forget who, who, what he's like. That he loves us. That he's committed to us how committed he is to, to getting his own glory from our ordinary lives that he is. He wants us to be victorious. He wants to have this victory. That's the purpose of church, right? We come together and, and, and we, we celebrate and God's presence shows up here. We, we come together and we're, we're here together. And man, you might have been browbeaten this week. And man, the evil one is out there and is just taking punches at you. And you come together and you're encouraged because our God is awesome. Our God is victorious. And you needed to be reminded of that today. Probably needed it last week like Wednesday, but you get it today, right? Then he says, here's the plan. This is what Nehemiah does. We remember the Lord. And then he says, here's the plan. Get together with your clan. Stay together in small groups. What an idea, right? Stay together in small groups. And, and, and you look at these vulnerable spots and, and, and you, you protect. You remember your sons and daughters, your wives and your homes. My friends, he puts them in a group. He puts them in there partially because day in and day out, they're living in the battlefield and they needed a group of people that they, they, they could do this thing together. They could look, they could see and they could be reminded that their God is bigger than whatever they can see, whatever they can do, um, whatever these other people can do to them. That their God is bigger than that. He puts them in life groups. That's what he did, right? It's brilliant, I think. I think Nehemiah is brilliant. I stole that totally from him. Actually, we've been doing this for a while, this idea of life groups. Why do we put people in life groups? Yeah, we want, you to, we want somebody to know your name, but we want you to be encouraged. We want you to know who your God is. We want you to walk with Jesus. And some days, some days are worse than others, and the battle's like right there, and you need other people that you can call on the phone, that you can be reminded that your God is good, your God loves you. Let's go on to verse 15. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of the men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. 
and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sounds, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us here. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn to the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helpers stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guard with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. Nehemiah sleeps ready. Here's the last point. There are moments in our life where we go, life is good. I feel like I'm doing great, right? Have you ever had those moments? And you're like, man, this is so wonderful. I feel like I, I've, I've defeated this sin in my life and I have great friends and they're reminding me of who Jesus is and the devil has fleed from me and this is awesome, right? And we have these moments and we have these times in our lives, right? And, and, and yet the Bible says, you be ready, you, you walk circumvently. You walk carefully in this world. I w- worked with this guy. He was a Vietnam vet. We c- came to staff meeting one day. We're sitting there, and he goes, do you hear that? And I thought he was hearing voices again. And, uh, and I was like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Like, what is he talking about? Because I hear nothing. It's absolutely silent. He goes, do you hear that? And he said this, you don't hear anything, but they're coming for you. Are you ready to stand firm? Are you ready to stand firm? I learned this in Vietnam, and this is true in this world too. When you hear nothing, you be ready to stand firm. In Ephesians chapter six, it basically says the same thing. Let's, let's run over there to Ephesians chapter six really quick. It says, finally be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. So there's this picture that there are good days and there are days where it's not really that big deal that you're standing and you're standing firm, but but there are days where the the power of the devil and his schemes are gonna come up against you and it's gonna be a it's gonna be this moment. And so so if you look at Nehemiah, he doesn't get into his jammies even, and I think you should get into your jammies, but he doesn't get into his jammies. He stands ready with his, with his sword. He doesn't change his clothes. Why? Because he realizes that there is a real enemy that is opposing what God has for him. And I wanna tell you this, church. There's a real enemy that we have that is opposing you. Are you ready to stand firm? We do a couple of things here to help you to stand firm. We do this collectively together. We do something called reality reading, right? And that is opening your Bible. And you read this and we read this together and we do this together. We do all of these things together. We're getting pretty good at this. Yay, like, let, we can, yeah, yeah, that's, you can give yourselves a hand. You guys are reading this and you're connecting with this and you're connecting with the text, it's awesome. Here's the next, I, I'm gonna give you our, our big scheme. We gotta get better at prayer. We have people, and I love you, you are prayer warriors, some of you, you are amazing. We send a prayer thing out and you are praying and I love that about you. But we have to get better at prayer. And so we're gonna do something, and we talked about this this week, and um, that we're going to fast and pray. We're not fasting and praying just to fast and pray to say we did something together. We're fasting and praying because because of this. There is darkness in this world all around us. And God has called us to proclaim the light of Jesus. Not to yell about the darkness, to proclaim the light, to go and to fight with the light of Jesus Christ. Are we standing firm? Are we ready to do this, church? That's why we're praying. 
We wanna be better at this. We wanna go, God, we don't want just ordinary church. We want extraordinary church, led by your spirit, moved by your spirit, guided by your spirit. That's why we're praying. That's where we're learning to do this. It's because the person sitting next to you is gonna fight sometime this week. Are you praying? For your brothers, your sisters, your families, your sons, your daughters. We know this. We can look around and I can read all the statistics in the world. People are leaving, young people are leaving the church. Middle-aged people are getting divorced. This, I can read all this stuff to you. But here's the deal. How do we fight against this? I can tell you, stop doing that. Come to church, right? I can tell you, stop getting divorced. Um, that's a bad idea, right? Like, I can tell you those things, but unless the spirit of the living God is moving and, and changing people's hearts and moving in a direction and we're praying and loving on each other in such a way that we would pray for your brothers and sisters. His speech, his speech at the end is beautiful in, in this passage. He, he says, man, we're gonna do this for our sons, our daughters, we're gonna do this for our homes, for our families. We're gonna do this and, and, and we're gonna come up against the reality of this evil. He had, a, he had a physical person named Sam Ballot, his name. We're not fighting Sam Ballots. Maybe you are, but you're also, you're fighting a, a real demon. His name is Satan. He has a multitude of real demonic forces. I appeal to you from the word of God, it says that this is true, to take heed that we would pray, that we would, we would believe that God is going to do something. We're told in the, in the Bible, this is awesome, that Jesus came and he crushed the serpent's head, being Satan. We have the victory in Jesus. We have the ability to do this. Not on our own, but through the power of the spirit of the living God. Let's pray together. Father, we're, we're coming. We're not always good at what you called us to do. But God, we wanna be better. We wanna be, we wanna be vessels that you use for your glory to not shout at the darkness and get all angry and frustrated at the darkness, but to proclaim the light of your son. He is the hope of the world. He is the hope of the world, and we want, to, we want to proclaim that wherever we go. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would protect them from the evil one, that we would pray for each other, that we would love each other enough, that we would pray for our sons and daughters, that we would pray for our families and our homes, that we would, would not, God, that we wouldn't be opposed ever, but God, that we would be ready for the battle, that we would stand firm because of your word. God, it is reality. Your word speaks to the reality of this world. God, let us be our hands open with the resources that we have. Let us be understanding that we are not the ones that make things extraordinary. It is only you through the work of your spirit. And we ask that you would do that in our hearts, in our lives, and in the world around us. God, let us see darkness, but let us proclaim the light that can change it. It's in Jesus' name, amen.